on, church. We're glad to be in the house of God this morning. Well, we're going to sing a new song today. So come on, let's sing together. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul. This bag bond. And I try with all my Let me hear it. Oh! What? How about the 49ers? Oh. And who's just happy to be in church today? Anybody? Woo! That's I me think too. I'm more excited Richard about the food I'm going to get. You know what oh, I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. We love Super Bowl food around here. Game day weekend is awesome. And hey, if you're here for the first time, we want to say what's up. My name is Chloe. This is Mike. And Central's a place where it's okay to not be okay. That means you can come in as you are. You belong, and we're so glad that you're here. Right, Mike? Yeah, let's give it up for all of our first-time guests. Woo! Welcome. 
welcome. We'd love it if you have a moment right afterwards, drop off to a place called New to Central. We want to say hi and give you a gift from our family to yours. Yeah, and, that's hey, right. a lot going on. We got a lot going on right now. We have something coming up right around the corner called First Step. In fact, if you're here and you're wondering, how can I join a team? You know, how can I get involved? The best way to do that is by attending First Step. And you can register and sign up by going to central.family. But it's right around the corner, right? Yeah, literally next weekend, uh, 18th and 19th, Central.family, you'll get all the times. But great way to meet friends, plug into the life of the church, and get activated in serving here. Probably the number one way, yep, best absolutely. way to serve. So you can go to Central.family to find out anything going on around here. Another good way to stay up to date is by downloading the Central Church app. You can go to your app store, on wherever you download apps, and just search Central Church. It's the Red Sea. You can't miss it. But one thing I want to emphasize today is that we are already taking signups and registrations for summer camp. Is summer anyone excited camp. for summer camp? That's incredible. Parents, come on. It's one week that your kids can go away and learn about Jesus, and you can take a break. It's going to be amazing. If your kid hasn't attended summer camp yet, that was one of my favorite parts of being a student, which feel, like feels like yesterday. It was so long ago. I now. know. Woo! But, you know, but we it's the best. Camp for like preschoolers, there's camp for kids, camp for junior high, camp for high school. Life changing. Absolutely. So many people's it'll, lives. It'll are be changed. the best week of their summer. But you can also check out more information about that by going to central.family. Well, you know, life change is important here at Central, right, church? Come on. We're, we've all been impacted by Jesus. And I can't wait for you to see the transformation that took place in the Foster's life. Check it out. My name is Omar Foster. This is my wife, Abby Foster. So we actually went to high school together. She worked for Red Bull, and I was just getting out of the military, trying to figure out my life. I knew I wanted to uh, be like a personal trainer and start my own gym, but we were uh, partiers. Went through our fair share of obstacles, you know, during the whole dating phase, and realized after talks and dating that, you know, like our, our goals and our morals and our values and our faith kind of aligned. And the growth that we had together as a couple opened up a completely different, I, I think, level of faith for me, too. Yeah. Just in terms of what does that look like when faith comes alive in your relationship? With the way that we've always run with our finance, like Omar has never been one to spend more than he makes. He's always lived under his means. And I think it showed, like, his trust, what, how his faith was rewarded with his trust and faith in what God was calling him to do. You know, when the closures happened in 2020, we were a small business, let alone a gym. We didn't know if we were gonna survive. So here we are, I'm nine months pregnant. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid I'm about to get furloughed from my job. Everyone's getting furloughed around me. We didn't know what was gonna happen with the business and we're about to have our second child. Like, insert panic. I was a self-proclaimed workaholic. And I remember in sitting and looking at my kids and thinking I was missing it. I was missing everything. And I know that they are the greatest blessing that God has ever given me. And I was living my life my way, the way I thought was the right way. But for me to see that as her husband, I realized she wasn't having quality time with him at all. And I was like, this is no way to live. I don't want to see you like this. If I want to be the leader of the home and the leader in our family, like I will do whatever it takes to make sure you were getting this time because I could see that she was missing it. And um, I lost my job unexpectedly. It was such a gut punch um, my, to my ego. I thought the, the sky was falling, everything was falling apart, like my worthiness is only based on like my productivity, which is the lie the world like wants to tell you, I think especially as a working mom. It's all God's provision, it's all His, and I think it took me losing my job and to be faced with that to really recognize like whose it is to begin with. Like the, we cut a lot of things, like as soon as, soon, I mean on the way home, I'm calling and canceling things, but the one thing that absolutely was a non-negotiable was money to the church. I could cut everything else. I could live without anything else, but I don't want to take away the thing that I feel the most called to give. The strength of the community that we had surrounded ourselves with us carried us through that storm. And we stayed super faithful in prayer and super faithful that if God wanted us to continue down this path, 
he would provide. And if it was time for a new journey, it was time for a new journey. And we survived that, I think, because we stayed true in our faith and not what we wanted. As our faith has gotten stronger and how that plays out, even in our business, the more that we're on the path that we're intended to be on, it's amazing how everything else falls into place. It's taught me that like to lean into the hard times and to lean into the trial because the muddy waters is when things actually become clear. I would tell like a younger couple to lean into God more, to pray, pray daily, just lean into it. When one door closes, another one opens and they close and open for a reason. It's not a matter of if you should be at church, you should be at church, you have to be at church because that is what keeps you steady. If you're strong in your faith and God is strong in your life, you'll hear him. If you listen, you'll hear him. What an incredible family. You know, the challenge is for all of us to pray a prayer, Jesus, what would you want from us? You know, it's a great prayer. In fact, if you were part of Centro over the past few weeks, you know that we were in a series and our pastor asked us to pray a prayer just like that, to take the generosity challenge to ask God, do you want more? Do you want more from my time? Do you want more from my talent? Do you want more from my financial resources? It's a prayer that I pray every year as we start the new year. And I've done it over the last 35 years. And I felt God tell me, I do want more of your time, your talent, and your financial resources. And my wife and I, we made a commitment to follow Jesus at a greater level than we've ever followed him and been available to him ever in our whole life. And you know, that's a prayer that we all should pray. And so the challenge is for us to pray that prayer and to take what we call the generosity challenge, which is a 90 day money back guarantee challenge. That if you say yes to Jesus, you want more of my financial resources. In fact, in 90 days, if you don't have more joy, more peace, more Jesus in your life, we'll give you your money back, no questions asked. That's how much we believe when we surrender this part of our life, God shows up big. And when you take that step, we have a generosity coin. It just says generosity rock star. When you say, I'm gonna sign up to give a reoccurring gift online, we wanna recognize that, celebrate that with you, and mark this moment along with a t-shirt. And here's what I want you to know, church. Every staff member, every board member, every leader in our church has taken that challenge and said yes to Jesus. We're all generosity rock stars, and we'd never ask you to do something that we wouldn't go first and model before you. I want you to know that. I can say that with all my heart and all my soul and all my strength. Right, church? Come on, we can do this, and you should take that step as well. It's easy to sign up. You can go to central.family, go to centralchurch.online, or find a generosity team member right after the experience. They're in the lobby. They'd love to help you take that next step. Well, let's go to God in prayer. Let's ask his blessing upon our lives. Would you join me? Well, Jesus, we truly want your blessing on our life today. We know that you're a God that wants to pour out your blessing, your favor. And so we come to you just surrendering our lives to you, knowing that you have our best in mind. You have our back. You're for us. You promise you'd never leave us or forsake us. God, that you who began that work in us, you promised that you complete it. And so we come to you believing that in our lives today. And I lift every person in this room to you today. I don't know what they're experiencing. Some have battles that they they need your strength. They need your encouragement. Some are experiencing difficulty in their life. They just need to know that you're with them and for them. God, there's others that have gathered today. They simply need a miracle. God, show up. Be a miracle in their life today. God, reveal yourself to them. You are all powerful. You can do a miracle. And we believe that in our lives today. And you promised, Jesus, as we draw near you, you would draw near us. So I pray you'd wrap your arms of love, your mercy, your goodness, and your grace around every one of us as we worship you. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
I believe today that, that we're, all, we're walking into this experience today, each of us facing some sort of burden, facing some sort of pain. I wanna challenge you today, if that's you, just to give it to God. He is such a great God. Imagine what he could do with your circumstances. Imagine what he could do in your circumstance. I don't know what it is you're facing, if there's something you're going through, if you're looking for a miracle, if you're waiting on a miracle. If that's you today, just put your hand in the air so we can pray for you around this place. And if you're near someone with their hand raised, would you reach out toward them? Let's pray together now. God, I lift up every individual reaching out to you, God. Thank you first and foremost for bringing them here right now to worship you, God. Whatever it is they're dealing with right now, they chose to show up and they chose to be in your house. So God bless them for that. And God, I pray whatever it is that, that comes to mind that they wanna surrender to you right now, God. Lord, that you would be so evident in the midst of what it is they're going through, God. Thank you for being there with them. Thank you for caring for them when it feels like no one else does. So God, right now, we extend it to you, God. Expectant of what you can do what only you can do. So God, we hand over all of our burdens, all of our shame. We bring them to you and nobody else, God, because only you can work through them. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.
beautiful and amazing. I'm so thankful that we get to worship together with our central family and really give everything to God because Amen. that's why we're here, right? We're here to really give them a praise. But um, speaking of just gathering together, yeah. I want to give a shout out to our Aliante location. Uh, we're so happy that we get to um, partner with you guys and just really worship God together. Yeah. But also shout out to our watch party hangouts that's happening um, all around, you know. Yeah. So anyone who's watching and joining us, we're so thankful for you guys. And a huge shout out to all the men and women who are watching through prison, f prison facilities through our partnership with God Behind Bars. We're so yeah, glad amazing, that you guys decided amazing. to join us here this weekend. Well, hey, we're in week two of our series called Love Your Neighbor. Let's welcome our Pastor Nick as he shares with us a message of hope. Yeah. All right, Central Family. Thanks for being with us. Super Bowl weekend. We got any 49er fans in the house with us today? Wow, 49er fans at the team. What about Chief fans? Any Chief fans? I think it's funny how this year the debate, the question isn't what team you're going for. It seems like the question is, is Taylor Swift good for football or not? Like that's where everybody is finding their differences. But my team isn't in it. The Raiders aren't in it this year. So I'm not necessarily choosing a team. I'm not going to let you know what team I'm rooting for. Although what I'm getting ready to say will make it sound like I'm rooting for a team, but I'm not. I'm rooting for a player. And Chief fans, don't be mad at me the rest of this experience and not listen to what I'm saying because the player I'm rooting for is Brock Purdy, the quarterback of the 49ers. And this is why. I mean, last pick in the NFL draft. I mean, he is the underdog story, the comeback story. And I've always won that I'm rooting for the underdog because often when I was young, I felt like I was the underdog. I mean, Brock Purdy getting picked last. Anybody else get picked last when they were a kid for a team? You know that feeling? It's not fun, right? I, I was picked last often because I was so small. I was short. I was an incredibly short kid. And, and junior year of high school, I was four foot 11. My parents were wondering, is he always going to be this short? I have a picture from high school. Uh, I'm on the left there. I'm actually older than my friend on the right there. And he's not a tall kid. That's just how short I was. So I knew what it was like to feel like the underdog. And for Brock Purdy, 32 other teams went through seven rounds of picks. That's 261 other names that were chosen, that were read while he waited there patiently just to hear his name read. And then with the 262nd pick, the 49ers were like, who's left? Um, let's just go with that Purdy kid. What could that hurt? Like, come on over, join our team. And he was labeled Mr. Irrelevant. And now Mr. Irrelevant, the last pick, is in a position to win it all for his team to become the ultimate comeback story. So I, I have a hard time not getting behind that kind of story. And in the book of Luke, which is where we're going to be today, it also highlights underdog stories, comeback stories. And we're in a series called Love Your Neighbor, where we've been exploring how to love others. And it's not only because it's the right thing to do, but also it's the best way to live if we want to experience a rich and a full life. I mean, Jesus taught this over and over again, especially in the book of Luke. And Luke, the author of Luke, he was a doctor, Dr. Luke, he was the only non-Jewish writer in the New Testament. So he knew himself what it was like to feel like an outsider. He knew a thing or two of what it felt like to be Mr. Irrelevant. 
And he had this special knack of just showing Jesus' love for the underdogs, for the outcasts, for the nobodies. And what I love is he often made them the heroes of the stories that he wrote about. And today, we're going to see this to be true as well. We're going to be in Luke 19, verse 1, and we're just going to look at the whole story together. We're going to first look at the story, and then we'll break it down. It's not very long. I'm going to read it to you. Luke 19, 1 says this. I'm going to need it. It's a, it's a lot. Uh, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead. He climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus, and he called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great joy and excitement. And then the people, they were so excited. They said, look at Jesus. His grace is for everyone. For Zacchaeus was lost and now he's found God is good. It's not what that says, is it? <laughs> what did it say the people were? It says the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. That sentence right there, that verse right there is proof that grace is easy to talk about, but it's hard to practice, especially when you know how messed up somebody is. So it goes on to tell us in the next verse, meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor. Lord, if I've cheated anyone on their taxes, if I cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. The son of man came to seek and save those who are what? Those who are lost. So today I want to look at the story of Zacchaeus and what it teaches us about loving the lost. And to do so, I think we need to look at three characters from this story. We have the character of the crowd, we have the character of Zacchaeus, and we have the character of Jesus. And the goal today is to learn to love others better, to have a compassionate heart, to love people the way that Jesus loved them. And I think the story of Zacchaeus is gonna help us do that. So first, if we're gonna love the lost better, the character I want us to look at first, or the characters I want us to look at first, is the crowd. And what the crowd teaches us is don't look down. Don't look down. H have you ever held in your life a title? Maybe it's a position that you didn't necessarily earn, that you didn't deserve. Several years ago, I worked for Starbucks. And part of Starbucks training program, one of the things they had available was this program you could enter called Coffee Master, where you could jump in and you could learn to be a coffee master. And if I'm of the personality type, if you throw that kind of prestigious title out there, like I don't want to be just a barista anymore. I want to be a coffee master. So I entered the program and we tasted hundreds of black coffees. I'm sitting around in groups of people that are also going through this training program and they're tasting the coffee and they're saying things like, mm, this, this one tastes like it grew amongst uh, black currants underneath the shade of a Costa Rican palm tree. Um, what? This tastes like dirt. Did it grow in dirt? That's what it tastes like to me. Because up to this point, sure, I work for Starbucks, but I didn't like coffee at this point in my life. Not only did I not co like coffee, I never drink it black. So here I am drinking hundreds of black coffee, trying to pick out the notes. It was incredibly difficult for me. But we got to the day where I'm to take my coffee master test. And my leader, my trainer, is sitting across from me administering this test. They put three cups of unmarked coffee in front of me. I'm to taste them, blind taste that test them, and tell them which three of the coffees were, what three uh, Starbucks flavored coffees these coffees were. Well, what the trainer, the, the one administering the test, didn't realize is that right behind them was the wall of all our whole bean coffee. The wall that that morning I had stocked, I had filled those shelves, I had pulled everything forward. And behind them are three empty holes where bags of coffee used to be, but they pulled down to administer my test and didn't pull them forward. 
So I at least knew what three coffees these three cups were. I just had to guess them right. I had a 30% chance. And after tasting three cups of coffee, guessing three times, you're looking at yourself a coffee master, right? Fake it till you make it, baby. I still can't tell you what the coffee is, what flavors are in it, but I've got the apron and I'm gonna sport that proud. But in the Bible, Zacchaeus, he was also given a title, but this title wasn't just by coincidence. It wasn't by cheating. It was one that he fully earned. It goes, if we look back in verse two, it tells us there was a man there named Zacchaeus. Now, first of all, just the name Zacchaeus himself. Zacchaeus in Hebrew, it meant pure, innocent, righteous. And Zacchaeus wasn't exactly living up to his name. And the Bible back in those days, I mean, still today oftentimes, but the names meant something. You were given a name based off what it meant. So him not living up to his name would have already been seen as a huge problem. But it says he was the what? Chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. Now, Kansas City fans, I know that your team's name is in red in this verse, and you're thinking, that's a sign, it's in the message today. Our team's gonna win. But that word there, that red word, that was not a good thing. That was not something to be proud of. Now, when the Bible says you're rich, you're rich. Zacchaeus was wealthy. And when it says he was the chief tax collector, that wasn't prestigious like being the CEO, the chief executive officer. No, ch chief tax collector was looked down on. It was despised. In our culture, we like to joke about not liking the IRS because none of us really like paying taxes, right? So we joke that we don't like the IRS, but comparing Zacchaeus' role to the IRS, it wouldn't even hold up because our tax structure here can at least be seen as reasonable sometimes, right? But Zacchaeus, he would have been viewed more like a member of the mafia, because his role was working for the Roman government. And this was a government that was already oppressing the Jewish people. So Zacchaeus, a Jew himself, was a sellout. The Romans were charging unfair taxes on his people. And no one really even knew what the tax structure was. They just taxed you on everything. There was an income tax, an import tax, a road tax, a harbor tax. If you caught a fish, there was a tax on every fish you caught. There was a ground tax. There was a cart tax. They taxed you on every wheel of your cart. It was better to have a two-wheel cart than a four-wheel cart because you're paying more taxes on those four wheels. Even if you breathe, there was a tax just to breathe. If they caught you breathing, you owed the Roman government money. So Zacchaeus, he had the role of collecting these unfair taxes for the Roman government. And then on top of that, he was collecting even more than what was owed to them so that he himself could become rich, so that he himself could be well off, destroying the lives of his very own people. And when you start messing with people's money, their families, their livelihood, when everyone else is struggling and you're scheming and you're thieving to make yourself rich, you're gonna quickly become an outsider. You're gonna quickly become hated in a hurry. And they wouldn't even let the tax collectors worship with them in the synagogues. Like if you were a tax collector, you essentially weren't allowed in the church. So when the Bible says chief tax collector, it might as well have said chief sellout, chief thief, chief scumbag, chief manipulator, chief criminal. The chief tax collector would have been amongst with the category with the murderers. I heard somebody say Kansas City chiefs. They put them in that category. I don't agree, but it hurt it. You know what's beautiful about the Bible? The very next verse, it tells us he was trying to get a look at Jesus. This short man, not only in stature, but in character, was trying to get a look at Jesus. This chief sellout, chief scumbag, chief manipulator, chief criminal, chief tax collector, this hated outsider was just trying to see Jesus. And I think sometimes we forget what that feeling is like. Sometimes we forget how far we've come since we've met Jesus. We forget that we too used to be like Zacchaeus, the worst of the worst. We forget that we disappointed others. 
We forget that we've disappointed ourselves, that we could be seen as the chief of all sinners. I know that to be true for me. I know that I can forget that I let people down, that I disappointed people, that I hurt others by my actions, that I myself was undeserving. But what we can't forget is that there was a day when we were the chief of something dark and we needed to see Jesus. We needed to see him in order to find our way out. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then the good news, it says, and by his grace, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus, we've been justified freely. So someone might look like they've been messed up. Someone might look like they're out to get us, but we don't know what that person's been through. What we don't know is that same person that looks like they're out to get us by day, that notorious sinner by day, that they're not home every night. They're full of so, so much guilt, they're full of so much shame, but when they get behind closed doors, when they get to a quiet place, when they get to a secret place, that they're not down on their face crying out to God, crying out to someone, to something that can save them, that can pull themselves out of the darkness that they feel like they're in. We don't get to pick and choose who sees Jesus. He's for everyone. Our mission as the church is to help others see him, to help others find him. And as we grow in Christ, as we follow him, what I'm afraid we have the tendency to do is to add to the crowd's numbers. Keeping our backs to the lost, making it hard for others to see Jesus. You see, in this story, the crowd wasn't a good thing. Yeah, sure, the crowd could claim that they're in close proximity to Jesus, but to Zacchaeus, the crowd blocked. The crowd condemned, the crowd separated, the crowd held grudges, the crowd pushed away, they pointed fingers, they ignored, they looked down on others. Central family, we're not called to be the crowd, we're called to be the church. We don't condemn, we forgive. We don't hold uh, grudges, we release offenses. We don't point fingers. We extend our hands. We don't look down on others. We lift them up. We don't ignore the lost. We seek them out. We don't push them away. We invite them in. We don't keep Jesus to ourselves. We make sure that we're sharing him with others, that we're sharing him with the world. We're not called to be the crowd. We're called to be the church. And the church is the body of Christ. It should be a reflection of his love. It should be a manifestation of his grace. Because we all fall short in different ways, but we all need the same Savior. The church is here to show others God's love, not to judge them. So we don't look down on others like the crowd did. The second character I want to look at today, making sure that we're keeping our hearts postured towards loving the lost, is the character of Zacchaeus. And what Zacchaeus is going to teach us in the story is to let God lift you up. As I said earlier, I was a short kid, and my wife also happened to be a small kid, a short kid, which means when we had three daughters, they're all short kids. They're always in the bottom percentile when it comes to height compared to other kids their age. But it also meant that every time we went to an amusement park or somewhere where there was a height requirement, that they were just always coming up a little bit short. And you're looking at these ride attendants like, come on, man. Come on, do you know what my day is going to be like if we have to walk away from here? There's going to be tears. There's going to be disappointment all over a couple centimeters. I mean, can they stand on their tippy toes and you just act like you didn't see it? Can I pull the dad card and say it's okay? I'll try to hold them in during this ride. I'll make sure I've got my arm on them. Like anything, like let this one go. But they always came up short. And we got tired of these disappointments and turning away and having to walk away them just kind of feeling shameful about being short and so we took some advice we went and I don't suggest you take this same advice let me uh disclaimer that we took some advice and we were told you know go out and just find some thick soled shoes buy some thicker soled shoes put them on them that should help give them at least maybe a half inch and then on top of that someone had given us the idea to put dominoes under their heel like in their shoe on the sole put dominoes in there because it allow them to not sink down but to almost be propped up like they're on their tippy toes. So we did this. 
Our kids walked around with game pieces in their shoes through this amusement park, uncomfortable, but you know what? They got on the ride. I looked at that ride attendant, I said, that's right, a couple centimeters over. <laughs> We're on. Zacchaeus, he would have known also what it was like to have short person problems. If you look back at verse three, it tells us he tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too what? He was too short to see over the crowd. Now, we don't have the exact height of Zacchaeus. His historians around that time, they would, or historians today around that time would believe that the average man, Hebrew man, would have been around five foot tall. This is archaeological digs, the height of entryways. They would say the average man is five foot tall. So if Zacchaeus is noticeably short compared to five foot tall, he would have been a wee little man, like the song says. He was a short guy. But Zacchaeus being short is not just some random detail the Bible is giving us. It's not trying to pick out like that Zacchaeus had some flaw and make fun of him. The, the Bible is very specific with words. I mean, think about it. Do you know how big Noah's hands were when he built that ark? I mean, he had to have some big hands. We gotta know how big the hands are, right? No, we don't, because the Bible doesn't tell us. It's not important. Or what was Peter's shoe size? I mean, Peter walked on water. Surely we know how big Peter's feet were. But we don't, because it's not important. But the Bible does tell us that Zacchaeus was short because it is important, because it matters. And it's teaching us something. And I believe what Luke is teaching us, what we need to learn, is that we are all like Zacchaeus. We all have times and places where we too come up short, where we don't feel like we're good enough. We don't feel like we're as good as everyone around us, that everyone is just better than us. And we might try to look tall, but in the end, we always fall short, right? Like we might try to look tall in appearance, but we're small in confidence. So we look fine on the outside, but on the inside, we always feel bad. We might try to look tall in achievements, but we're small in satisfaction. Sure, we have a lot of awards, we have a lot of accolades, but we still feel empty, we still feel unfulfilled. Maybe we're tall in popularity, but we feel small in intimacy. We've got a lot of followers on our social media. We've got a lot of friends, but does anyone really know us? Is there really any depth to that relationship? We may try to look tall at work, but we're small in our home. We give everything we have to our job all day long, and when we get home, we've got nothing left to give. Or maybe we feel tall in our faith but we're small in our grace. So we believe in God, we follow his commands, but we don't show mercy and forgiveness to others. Listen, we are all like Zacchaeus, all of us, all of us. We all have times when we feel small, but the Bible doesn't want us to try to pretend to be tall. God wants us to accept our shortness, to use it to draw closer to him. The worst thing we can do is hide our shortness with false greatness, to try to impress others with what we have or what we do. The Bible wants us to seek God, to give him our shortness. Our shortness should lead us to Jesus because weakness is not bad. When we come up short, it should be a reminder to take our weakness to our savior. But what we do is we do the opposite. I do the opposite. It's by my clothes, look what I'm wearing. I'm tall in what I'm wearing. Look at my friends. Look at my car. Look at my home. Look at my knowledge. Look how tall I am. But none of that matters without Jesus. None of it. Zacchaeus was willing to do whatever it took to see Jesus. He ran ahead. He climbed a tree. He didn't care what people thought. He didn't care what they said. He, cared, he didn't care about his, his dignity. He didn't care about his reputation. All he cared about was seeing Jesus. And Jesus cared about him. So when you feel short in temper, remember God can lift you with patience. When you feel short in understanding, God can lift you with compassion. When you feel short in courage, God can lift you with strength. When you feel short in wisdom, he can lift you with guidance. When you feel short in joy, he can lift you with peace. And when you feel short in grace, God can lift you with his love. A feeling of shortness. When we feel short, it can either lead to a victim mindset 
Well, where it's all about our shortcomings and we just feel like life isn't fair, that everything, everyone is out to get us, that we were given a bad star, a bad foot in life, a bad lot. Or it can lead us to a heart of humility. If we accept our shortness, we let God lift us and transform us with humility. If we seek his greatness, if we follow his way, then we're gonna find that being small is actually a blessing. Jesus tells us this in Matthew 5, 3. He says, God will bless those who poor are poor and realize their need for him. So our humility is the key to unlocking our capacity to love others as they are. I'm gonna say that again. I don't want you to miss that today. Our humility is the key to unlocking our capacity to love others as they are. We let God lift us when we feel small. And then the last way, the last way this story, the Zacchaeus story, teaches us to love the loss is to look up. The other night, we were deciding what we were gonna eat as a family, where we were gonna go to dinner. And getting five people to agree on one thing, like what they feel like, is always a chore. Every single day is a chore. But we had four of us that really felt like we wanted Panera. Like Panera was a great choice, we were gonna go to Panera. My youngest, Cosette, she started throwing a fit, though. Like, oh, I don't like Panera. Panera's the worst. I hate Panera. Panera's awful. I know I asked for it yesterday, but today I hate it. I don't want Panera. Well, my oldest, Avery, she yelled something out, and it made me laugh, because I had never heard this before. She goes, Cosette, you're not the main character. I was like, that's good. That'll preach. Because what she was saying is, Cosette, it's not all about you. Cosette, I know you think this moment's about you, that we all care whether you like Panera or not, but four of us want to go, and just because you don't doesn't mean we're not going to. And I think oftentimes in life, we all think it's all about us, right? Like we're the main character, even though we're not. And when we read the story in Luke 19, I think it's easy to assume that Zacchaeus, that he's the main character. But in the Bible, whenever Jesus enters the scene, you quickly realize he's the main character. He's always the main character. And when it comes to learning to love others better, to learn, learn to love the lost, there is no better example than to learn from him, to learn from Jesus. So here's Zacchaeus. He's unable to see Jesus through the crowd, but he doesn't let the crowd block him. He runs, he climbs up in a sycamore tree. Have you ever, any day, seen a short, rich man run and climb a tree? Like, can you picture, I'm not saying Warren Buffett's short, but can you picture Warren Buffett at a concert, like getting excited, running and climbing a tree? It just doesn't happen. But Zacchaeus, he didn't care. He climbs up into a tree and he waits to see Jesus. He just wants to get a glimpse of this man everyone's telling him stories about. And then let's look back at verse five, what it tells us that, that happens. It says, when Jesus came by, he what? He looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. So Jesus is walking with the crowd. He's walking through Jericho down this pathway. It's noisy, it's busy. People are wanting his attention. They're trying to talk to him. They're trying to ask him things. It's chaos. He's walking along with this crowd. And when he gets to the spot underneath this sycamore tree, he stops and he looks up and he makes eye contact with Zacchaeus, which begs the question, was Zacchaeus looking for Jesus? Or was Jesus looking for Zacchaeus? And the Bible says he looks up, he calls him by name. And remember, Luke has this incredible gift of telling the story of the outsider. And what I love in this story is you get to see the heart of Jesus. Because Jesus looks up at this chief tax collector. He looks up at this short and despised man. He looks up at this notorious sinner, this outsider. And what's so amazing about this detail, and don't miss this, Jesus looking up, what's so amazing about this is that this is probably the first time in Zacchaeus' life that anyone has ever looked up to him. I mean, do you know the power of a savior that would look up to you when everyone else has looked down on you? 
Do you know the power of a savior that would accept you and embrace you when everyone else your whole life has shunned you and pushed you away? This is a reminder that Jesus, in his perfection, he, if he can lift his head, if he can look up at a tax collector, to a thief, to a traitor, to a sellout, to a notorious sinner, well then how much more should we? Jesus looked up. And not only did he look up, he called Zacchaeus by name. For the first time in Zacchaeus' life probably with no sarcasm in his voice, because do you remember what Zacchaeus meant? Jesus looks up, he says, Zacchaeus, pure one, innocent one, righteous one, come down. I'm going to your house. I'm going to spend some time with you today. I've been looking for you, Zacchaeus. The savior of the world is looking up at him when the rest of the world's looked down on him. He's calling him by name and not the name that he's been, but by the name Jesus knows that he can become. I mean, that's real love. That's love shown by our savior. That's the kind of love towards the lost that we need to imitate as the church. I mean, to those who have bowed their heads that have looked down in guilt, who have looked down on themselves in shame, they call themselves guilty. We can look up at them. We can call them by the name that Jesus calls them, which is forgiven. To those who have looked down in shame and call themselves alone, we can look up at them. We can call them by the name Jesus calls them, which is family. To those who have looked down and called themselves unworthy, we can look up and we can call them the name Jesus calls them, which is valuable. To those who say they're broken, Jesus says they're whole. To those who say I'm a nobody, Jesus says they're a somebody. To those who say unloved, Jesus says beloved. And to those who have looked down on themselves, to those in guilt and shame that have said that they call themselves lost, we can look up at them. We can call them by the name that Jesus calls them, which is found. Jesus calls people by their potential, not their past. Jesus sees you not for who you were, but for who you can be. He says to Zacchaeus, I love you. I want to hang out with you today. And in those days, when you told someone that you were going to their house, what that meant is that you were fully accepting them for who they were. And Zacchaeus, he might have been rich. He might have had all the stuff. He might have been wealthy, but I guarantee you what he didn't have was relationship. I can guarantee you he didn't have very many house guests that Zacchaeus often felt lonely. And Jesus, he publicly accepts him. He tells him he's going to his house. And how does the crowd respond? They get angry. They get displeased. Church, let's not be like the crowd. The crowd wanted Zacchaeus to pay for how he wronged them. The crowd wanted to kick him out. The crowd wanted to keep him out. The crowd didn't want him to experience the miracle of Jesus because they wanted him to suffer. This man had hurt them. Jesus, you should hate him. He's not worthy. The crowd had forgotten that they too fall short, that they too were in need of forgiveness. But Jesus, he shows Zacchaeus compassion. He shows him love. And once at his home, Jesus doesn't need to say anything else. His love, his acceptance for Zacchaeus was the only message that was needed. And then what did Zacchaeus do? He turned his whole life around. That's the power of Jesus' love. Zacchaeus is filled with remorse. He confesses his wrongs. He doesn't need to be judged. He doesn't need to be condemned. He knew what he had done. He knew that he had messed up. He didn't need anyone else pointing that out. He didn't need anybody else telling him that. All he needed was a savior to love him. And it was right then and there that he was ready to right all his wrongs, that he was ready to give back to those he had taken from, to walk in a new life. And then how does the story end? It says, today salvation has come to this house for the son of man, Jesus, came to find and save the lost. Jesus loves the lost, and so should we. Let's not look down on others. Let's trust God to fill the gap when we come up short. Let's be like Jesus, looking up to others with love and acceptance. Letting our love speak of his love, which will in turn transform their life. Maybe you're here today 
Maybe you're saying to yourself, love the lost. I am the lost. I've been lost. Maybe you're here and you're drowning in guilt, shame, loneliness, emptiness. You're online. You're watching in a prison facility. You feel like the whole world has always looked down on you, that there's no hope for you. I want to introduce you to a Savior who looks up to you, who calls you by your future, not your past. And I believe to some, he's softly saying, let me into your home. I'm here. I've been searching for you. Let me in and I will change everything for the better. Experience my love. And if that's you, if you want to accept his invitation today, if you want to invite him in, naming him your Lord and Savior, then all you have to do is pray a prayer. Now it's meaning something with your whole heart. It's giving your whole life away. It's dying to yourself, but in the same time, it's the best decision that you'll ever make because you'll watch your whole life flipped around. So church, you could do me a favor. If you could bow your heads, close your eyes. If you want to name Jesus your personal Lord and Savior, then just pray this prayer after me. Just pray, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. Some might even say the chief of sinners. But I also know that you died on a cross, that you rose from a grave to forgive me of those sins. So I ask for that forgiveness now. I wanna name Jesus my personal Lord and Savior. I wanna invite him into my life. Change everything for the better, God. Help me become a new person. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you just do me a favor, just slip your hand up in the air. What you're doing is you're just boldly declaring before God, just saying, I'm gonna follow you. I'm gonna trust you. I give my life to you. I trust you, Jesus. Thank you for those hands. Thank you. I promise you the best decision you'll ever make. If you're online, if you're in a prison facility, we can't see those hands. Know that God sees them. Just reach out to him. God, I thank you for these hands. I thank you for these lives, for these individuals that are trusting you, that are inviting you in, that are accepting your invitation, God. Transform their lives for the better. Pull close to them. And for each of us, God, thank you for being a God. Thank you for sending Jesus to teach us how to love the lost. Let us not forget how Jesus loves. Let let us not get distracted by this world. Let us trust you and love like him. It's in your name that we pray these things. Amen. Church, can we give it up for anyone who just made a decision to follow Jesus today?